Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Dealing with the Islamic State or ISIS and the very real prospect of endless war. The enemy's name remains undefined, the geographical place of this war fluid, timelines open, and the cost a guesstimate. How convenient for the powers that be. To crosstalk America's endless wars in the Middle East, I'm joined by my guest, Sabah al Mukhtar in London. He is a lawyer, an independent political analyst, as well as an expert on Iraqi affairs. In Colombia, we have Joseph Allmart. He is a Middle East expert and professor at the University of South Carolina. And in Washington, we cross the Gareth Porter. He is an independent investigative journalist and historian. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules. In fact, that means you can jump in anytime you want, and I very much encourage it. Uh, Gareth, if I can go to you first in Washington, is it an exaggeration to call American foreign policy? in the Middle East endless war? Well, absolutely not. Uh, it absolutely describes the reality that we see uh, on the ground and in the air, uh, not just in, uh, of course, in, in uh, Iraq and in Syria, but elsewhere uh, in the greater Middle East. Uh, the drone wars that continue in Pakistan, uh, in Yemen, the United States continues uh, similar, similar sorts of military operations. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a formula that has been practiced for a number of years now. That is, uh, goes back to, uh, a f to the early post-9-11 uh, period when the U.S. military services came up with the idea, particularly the Army, of uh, a perpetual war uh, against terrorism. So I think what we're seeing is nothing new in that regard, but certainly uh, it's a more concentrated uh, version of that uh, policy. Okay, Saba, in London, you know, we, uh, we often talk about regime change, but this is regional change. The entire region is being changed, transformed through endless outside wars. Well, certainly, I think the, the, the idea of creating this virtual enemy and having no time limit and trying to fight something which is not there, it, has, it leaves it, itself open to all agendas, whether you want to change the regime or you change the people or you change the countries or the boundaries. And this is where uh, the ugly American is really going to be ugly. I think there will come a time where Americans cannot go anywhere in the world, not even in Europe, because at this rate we are going, we are, we are harming people. Today, the Americans and the British, indeed, our, our David Cameron here is talking about the coalition of 40 countries. And you look at them because the UAE have sent uh, uh, Maryam, uh, uh, a, a pilot from the UAE. That's how we are going to end up and ISIS. And we in Britain, we have six airplanes uh, stationed in Cyprus. They go over Iraq and come back. And that's it. We're going to get rid of ISIS. And when you ask them, what is ISIS? And this is a challenge for anybody who can tell us what's an ISIS without a black flag. So a person who does not carry a black flag, whether he chops heads or not, is he an ISIS or not? Okay, it's very interesting is that, you know, we all know from a media we should be very, very, very afraid. That's the message from the media. Uh, Joseph, if I can go to you, what kind of responsibility is it to say from, you know, we have the elites in the United States, this could be a 30-year war. I mean, they found out about ISIS only a few months ago, but they have a pretty good idea how long this war is going to last. What kind of logic is that? Go ahead, Joseph in Colombia. Well, I don't know about 30 years war or uh, anything like that, you know. I don't know if I will live in, uh, even live to see this 30 years war, you know. <laughs> no, that's what I'm <laughs> but saying. But let me tell you, look, uh, these are conflicts, look, these are conflicts that have a domestic and regional connotation, and the international one is not the only connotation or not necessarily even the most important one. Because if you take Syria, for example, the breakup of Syria to its constituent sectarian elements is something that has been there for years because of the repression of an Alawite-dominated regime against other elements of the population. The fact that there was a government in Iraq ruled by the Shiites that seemed to be, and I'm saying seemed to be, uh, dominating Sunni affairs, and many Sunnis did not like it, it's an Iraqi affair. And ISIS was there for years because it was established a few years ago, at least uh, seven or eight years ago, by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. The Americans should have known about that. The fact that they are failing repeatedly 
in understanding what happens in countries which they are supposed to know about, it's another story that we can discuss, you know. Yeah, but well, the fact of the matter is yeah, that I, now they are engaged in a conflict. In? Yeah, 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 I'm not I, sure, I, by the way, let uh, me just please finish. Go ahead. Go ahead, finish let, up. let me just finish this uh, uh, yeah. point very quickly. I, you know, if you follow my writings about uh, this situation, you can see that I'm not a great uh, supporter of uh, full-fledged American intervention or not. It's not for me to say it. But I can tell you that if they decided to intervene in Iraq in that case, they do it because they have invested so much already in Iraq before that, I mean, it could collapse completely and then there will be so many questions being aroused. But how to do it, with whom to do it, and under what circumstances, that remains to be seen. Let's yeah, see it, and let's it, discuss it. That, that's, the, that's the wonderful thing about all of this, Saba, isn't it? Is that you can do anything you want. You can work with anybody you want. You can destroy any regime you want because you have a completely open mandate. It's amazing. And not only that, but because we have people well, who just... I don't know if that... As, as we have just heard, and this is... I'm, I'm not saying that it's... You know, I'm not, not putting words in anybody's mouth or saying their intentions. But at the end of the day, the Alawites and the Shiites and the Sunnis, they didn't happen yesterday. They didn't happen three years ago. The Shiites and the Alawites and the Sunnis have been there with all their differences for the last 30 years. Why did we have this? The divide and rule policy is not something new. The Romans practiced it. Everybody practiced it. You go into a place and you make people fight each other and you say, hey, you know what? It's not our problem. It's their problem. They are creating it. It's the, it's the Shiites or the Sunnis or the blacks or the whites or whatever uh, other My friend, my friend you want in London, use. let me... Let... Go ahead, react. Go ahead, Peter, Joseph. Let me interject here, please. My friend... My friend in London, look again, it's not for me to interfere in domestic uh, internal Islamic conflicts, but if you look at the situation in Syria, you are aware, of course, I'm sure, of the famous fatwa by Ibn Taymiyyah already 700 years ago against the Alawites and all that. You are aware of the fact that there was a civil war in Syria between 76 to 82. You are aware of the Hamas situation in Syria in the 1960s, let alone the massacre of 1982. So there's nothing new about that. It's not the last 13 years. It's not the last three well, years. Well, let me jump it in here. Let, let me jump in here. Then, I, I think it is. I'm sorry, Joseph. I think it is very, very different here. Let me go back to Gareth because, as I said, you know, you know, the United States is trying to master regime change all around the world, but this is region change. It's to change the entire region to make everyone fight each other and redraw all the lines. Go ahead, Gareth. Well, I think that's, a, that's perhaps attributing far too much strategic thought okay. right, to, this, uh, current, to this current war. I, I think what I would characterize it as being much more of a thoughtless uh, response to uh, uh, the rise of, of ISIS or, or Daesh um, in a situation particularly where there was a beheading of Americans uh, creating a firestorm politically in the United States what uh, I see happening here is the Obama administration uh, believing that it had to do something instead of just standing uh. there, and therefore uh, we have this war. I, I don't think that there is nearly the kind of strategic concept uh, uh, behind this that you're suggesting. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, the other players in the region certainly do have their own political military strategies. Um, and, of course, the Sunni regimes, as has been pointed out already uh, in this discussion, are, are very much interested in promoting their own uh, interests, and that uh, involves the overthrow of the regime in Syria primarily. So we have basically uh, a, a group of allies, uh, of course, Turkey not a formal ally in this case, but considered an ally of the United States in the region, uh, not interested at all in what the United States is supposedly trying to do, but on the contrary, uh, interested uh, in overthrowing uh, the Assad regime. And uh, the Saudis certainly closer to that than to any real commitment to uh, uh, primary to primacy uh, uh, with the uh, the stopping and uh, destruction of Daesh. So, you know, my question is, why is the United States doing this? Uh, yes, it's not for exactly. any real 
Exactly. Let, 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 me, let me go to Saba here. That's a very good point because this is exactly what ISIS wants. They want the United States to attack them. They want to be bombed. They, they want boots on the ground. It's a great recruiting uh, advertisement. They're taking on the greatest military power in the world that can't win a military conflict because it's asymmetrical. Go ahead, Saba. Well, maybe you, you can interpret it this way as if it is their intention. I don't necessarily agree with that. I actually do not agree with that. Okay. But this is, this is built, built on, the pro, on the premise that all those who are fighting now in this part of, of Iraq are all ISIS. And this is the biggest fallacy in the argument. Because ISIS is there. It's a terrorist organization. It's a big one. It's an efficient one. However, it is not the controlling power. There are, the, uh, there are the tribal leaders and council. There is the military council. There are the people before uh, 9th of June who were uprising for the last year. So, but now it's very convenient. We are calling everybody ISIS. Mm. And that is what's making even worse. It's recruiting more people for ISIS as we see it because they are saying, what's happening now? We have the U.S. and Iran teaming up against us. Both of them are teaming up with the government in Baghdad, and all of them are talking about the infidels and the, and the Christians and I don't know what, and the, 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 the Yazidis. And so everybody is our enemy. Therefore, we have all to be together. They are putting people in the fighting who would not have otherwise been there, but there is this conglomerate of enemies. Where now the people in Iraq are being killed by both bombers from the Britain yeah. and the U.S. and what have you, as well as bombers from uh, uh, Abadi, as well as bombers from Iran. So how can you expect the ordinary people not to have sympathy or empathy of their own prosecutors? Don't forget, the ones who are paying the price for ISIS are the Iraqis. It's not us in Britain. It's not in the UK. And certainly, it okay, is not Saba, in I have to jump in here. Canada, We're going to We're gonna go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on the Middle East. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we're discussing America's endless wars in the Middle East. Okay, Joseph, I'd like to go back to you uh, in Colombia. You know, we're, we're told this thing could last 30 years. What's the end game? I, I, what, 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 is, what does it look, well, the Middle East, the whole region look like when ISIS is seemingly destroyed? What does that mean to you? Okay, uh, that, that's, a great, uh, that's a great question, but let me start by saying, first of all, I do agree with Garrett over there, you know, because I, I really criticize a lot of the American policy there because, I, as I said myself, I mean, they should have known about ISIS, they should have known about all that, but they don't really have a real strategy, and it is a collection of tactical steps, you know, and uh, that leads me to the, your question, and uh, I have advocated for quite a long while, and I, <laughs> I think that I'll be attacked now, by, of course, friendly-wise, by uh, Sabah in London, but look, the strategic solution to all that should be the breakup of the Levant into the constituent sectarian population that cannot and do not want to live peacefully with each other. In Syria, it is already happening. In a way, you have Alawistan, uh, you have Druzistan, you have, in a way, Kurdistan. And uh, the regime is still hanging on to parts of the other uh, territories, of course, Alawistan as well. But uh, you, you have to ask yourself the question for how long. And that brings me also to the question as to why Turkey is not involved in all that, because the Turks are very much concerned about uh, Tur uh, Kurdish territory yep. in north and uh, northeastern Syria, stretching also to the other parts of Iraq on their borders. And they want to have guarantees about this before they involve themselves in this fighting uh, in Syria or in Iraq. So look, the problem really is that all these uh, new ideas or nice ideas, I don't know how people uh, will uh, relate to them that I've just raised here, it's not going to happen. Peacefully, it's going to happen through some kind of battle, and it's already happened through okay, some kind well, of battle. Okay, let me let me go to, let me go to Saba here. Let me let me to, to react to that because I mean, for for thousands, hundreds and hundreds of years, these communities lived together. 
Uh, at least that's my understanding of history. And then you have these outside interventions and the breaking up of states, and then everyone gets uh, goes for each other's throats here. I mean, that's the timeline I see here right now. And having little statelets they cannot defend themselves. That's probably a big mistake as well. So um, I don't have the answer to it, but what we just heard there probably isn't it. Go ahead, Saba. You know, this is actually, it's been mooted by many people. They talk about it, but uh, there are questions about it. How far do you divide into the city-state? How far do you divide people? So you have a state called Baghdad. What do you do between, in case our friend doesn't know, there is a difference between the people on the uh, right side of the river and the left right of uh, the river. You have people with different... Mosul and, and Erbil cannot work together. Within the Kurds, you have... So how far do you divide it? Do you make it into 200 states or something? So I think it's a, it, is a, a, it is an idea which is being mooted, but I don't think it's realistic. However, certainly the killing which is going on, it is destroying these countries. Yeah. It's destroying the people. It, at the same time, it is not necessarily based on sectarian or religion or ethnicity. Here in Britain, we have the football hooligans who go and fight with each other because one of them carry a blue flag and the other one a green flag. We can fight on any issue. This, this is not the reason for it. However, when the outside world pretends that you can have these 40 countries from the air get rid of terrorism, and when we decide who is a terrorist, who is not, on which side, and we have in various parts of the world, it depends on which side of the fence you are, whether you are a terrorist or you are a freedom fighter. Yeah. I don't want to go into that one, yeah. but I think at the end of the day, the problem there is not, this is not the basis for it. I think it's the outside interference, whether it's Iran or Saudi Arabia or Turkey or whatever. And this is what we have done in Syria, because every country was supporting one faction against the other on condition that they fight the other faction. Okay, G Gareth, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the things when I look at Washington's policy towards this region here, it, I, sometimes I think there's a master plan and then it's just bungling e every step of the way. And sometimes they kind of inter they intertwine at times because having chaos does work to the agenda of many people. Uh, the, the Gulf countries, uh, they like to see a lot of chaos. The United States and its ally Israel, they like to see everyone fighting each other. Uh, and, you know, and then there's always, in the back of my mind, all of this hype here, the media hype is just a way to go after Iran and break up the state of Syria. This is, you know, it's not, it's not attacking ISIS in Syria, it's destroying Syria's infrastructure for regime change. And you're selling it that way. That's the way, that's the bill of goods. Well, I think the United States certainly has practiced, as you have suggested, the, uh, uh, the, the strategy of, of getting one enemy to fight against another enemy. Of course, that's a classic strategy that Israel has always pushed forward uh, for decades. Um, and, and in the Middle East, certainly uh, since 9-11, the United States has done that uh, more than ever before. And, and that's what was going on, at least in part, in Libya. Um, the, the idea that the United States was willing to support some of the jihadists uh, on, the, uh, on the hope that they would uh, fight against uh, some other enemies of the United States. And all that contributed, of course, to the uh, rise of, of Daesh, uh, which we're seeing today. Uh, this is fundamentally, uh, in my view, though, an irrational a uh, process which is guided by lack of, of understanding, lack of information, U.S. intelligence on uh, the Middle East, as the rest of the world, uh, is, is almost completely based on electronic surveillance, on what the NSA picks up. And that is uh, an extremely faulty basis on which to try to make policy, uh, as I think has just been pointed out in a piece uh, in Al Jazeera by, uh, by a Russian uh, specialist. Uh, uh, so so another, Peter, another point that I, I want to make. Very... Okay, okay, finish your point there, Gareth, and then we'll go to Colombia. Go ahead, Gareth. Well, the other point I want to make is that uh, the United States now has admitted in the past 24 hours for the first time that, uh, and this is the Pentagon spokesman, that the United States has no groups that it can work with in Syria. And this is after <laughs> selling this policy in part on the basis that we will assist, you know, Syrian, uh, you know, moderates to, to resist uh, both the, uh, well, to, uh, obviously to, to resist, uh, continue to resist the regime in Syria, but also to resist Daesh. 
Okay, Joseph, you want to jump in there? You know, I, uh, just, to pre I just to, pre uh, just to preface, uh... just to preface my com you, my comment here. I mean, ever since the events of 9/11 and looking at the Middle East, I can't see how any American foreign policy and its allies has worked to its advantage. Go ahead, Joseph in Colombia. Go ahead. Uh, let me just make a quick comment uh, about uh, Syria and what could be Israeli designs there. And I think that Garrett, with all due respect, I mean, the Israelis like the Assad regime. You'll be surprised to hear that. The Assad regime was good to Israel because the Assad regime did not want to go to war with Israel, was not ready to do it, did not intend to do it. When the Israelis wanted to offer him the entire Golan Heights in return for peace that will separate him from Tehran, he chose Tehran after, uh, over the Golanites and didn't make peace with Israel. So it was even better for the Israelis. The problem is that now when Syria will be broken up as it is, you never know who will be in control of all kinds of territories. And this is always not good for those who are neighboring countries such as Jordan and Israel. Yeah, well, it's, so it's, put aside this one, Israeli factor is not there. There well, is no Israeli it, factor. It's here, always the law. It's this. law of the law of let, let, let consequences. Let, let you never know this. what you're going to get. Go ahead, Joseph. Go ahead. Finish let up. me finish. Go ahead. Let me finish, please. There is no Israeli, there is no Israeli uh, element here at all. The Israelis wanted Bashar Assad to stay in power. And by the way, I, you know, I know it. Okay. But let's move on now to what uh, I heard before from our friend in, in London. Yes, he's right. The Kurds is tribal society, the Shiites, the Sunnis and all that. The left uh, bank of the Tigris in Baghdad, the right bank. All this is very true. But still is the case that most Shiites, most Sunnis and most Kurds can live together with each other within their own respective territories. So it is not an ideal solution, but what is the solution? More and more and more and more bloodshed. Look, the most peaceful part of uh, northern Iraq are uh, the, Kurd ter the Kurdish territory. This is a very peaceful part, and they live together with each other over there, even though there were troubles before between the Taliban faction and the Barazani faction. So it is not an ideal situation, but it is a more realistic reflection of what is really happening on the ground. Okay, Saba in London, you want to react to what you've heard here? Yeah, first of all, I'm not going to be drawn to this idea of dividing all these countries into tiny little city-states. But I would like to talk on the U.S. foreign policy. If you look at the 11th September, you had Saudis bombing the towers. Uh, America went and attacked Afghanistan and then attacked Iraq. And now they, are, they said that they will do all the things close Guantanamo, they will withdraw out of Iraq, and now Obama seems to be following exactly on the identical thing of the Bush doctrine. You create the army, you create the enemy, it's a fictional enemy, you have no time limit, you go there and you get the coalition of people, uh, like, as I said, a, a, a lady flyer from Abu Dhabi, uh, Maryam al Mansouri, uh, she is going to get rid of ISIS in the world, and actually, Prime ministers of countries like Canada, like Australia, like United Kingdom actually genuinely go out without fear or without shame to tell us that this is how we're going to get rid of ISIS when they don't even know what they are fighting. You can never fight terrorists from the air. I'm not suggesting we send boots, but everybody wants somebody else to go and fight on their yeah. behalf because they, they don't know what the enemy is. Okay, Gareth, I'm going to give the last word there. 30 seconds. I go couldn't ahead. agree more with that. Go ahead. 30 seconds, I, last I word. I couldn't agree more with that. And I would just add that what really needs to happen is to let the inherent internal contradictions within Daesh, uh, ISIS, uh, work themselves out. I mean, to begin with, ISIS has an alliance with the Ba'athist military people who have provided a great deal of its military uh, uh, potential. And that is obviously an internal contradiction that cannot continue. Uh, it's going to be a major weakness, and an, an internal source of, of intense conflict, which I think we should uh, let it uh, uh, play itself out rather than to do as others have pointed out, to, to continue yeah. to give legitimacy we, we, yeah, yeah, We've run out of time here, but movement. it seems like the, the, what we're going to get is something must be done, and that's always the case. Many thanks to my guests in London, Columbia, and in Washington, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules.